Hey guys, to Legit City here. Today in the game of Oxford Included, we're gonna be going over the Fast Friends patch that just went live. If you guys saw the previous video where we went over the quick sneak peek of the Fast Friends DLC free content update, and of course, who doesn't like free content, is going to be a continuation of that. Now that we have the patch go live, we can see the values set in stone as they're not gonna change outside of a new patch or a hotfix. We're going to be going over a lot of the changes today, and to start it off, we're going to go over what I think is the biggest change. There was a huge performance update. Clay went back to the behind the scenes of the codes and made it more efficient. They took away a lot of animations that are running in the background, made it so that you would use less memory for a lot of this, and you guys could see all the details in the patch notes, but the improvement is going to be overall everywhere. Opening up menus, going into some of the overlays, going into some of the other screens, loading up some of these menus are not going to take as long anymore, as well as having your saving and loading be a lot faster as well. There's going to be a easier time doing all of that as Clay's made it more efficient, not going to go into the details, but there is a big performance update. This means that you could easily go into some of your old files, some of your classic starts where you have a large classic start, but because you got into the exploration of all your star map, you explored the other colonies, you found that you started to lag and it may become unbearable and because of that you might have quit playing some of your playthroughs or this might force you to play in a certain style to avoid flying critters or avoid doing other things that are indicators of lag so because of that you can easily go back to your old save to check out the performance change this is, from what I've been told, pretty noticeable by various other people in the community, and I see it as well. As you can see, my classic start is no longer lagging, and I am not forced to play on 1x speed anymore, as the simulation is still smooth, and I can't be mad about that. Now, the performance update was probably the most important one, but the next big one is going to be ranching. Now, ranching, if you guys were familiar with, was a skill that you guys were only able to level up and have that gain EXP by having your duplicates lullaby and hug the eggs in the incubator. This was the sole way, as the only way, for you to level up your husbandry skill. Now, husbandry in and of itself really only had to tie to the grooming of your critters, meaning that the higher your husbandry skill, the less often you had to groom your critters, as the groom effect will last longer. The husbandry skill now is going to actually tie to the incubators hugging lullaby. Also, they're going to gain experience from both the shearing station and the grooming station. A much awaited change. Everyone probably loves that. And we've been waiting for this change. Since there are other buildings that do the ranching task, it didn't make sense that only that specific building granted EXP. Not only that, husbandry now also affects your wrangling speed. Anytime you click on a critter, click wrangle, that speed for the animation of that is going to tie to how high your husbandry skill is. But of course, that has been a long way to change with the experience gain of that. Now, there's going to be some other changes as well. And let's get into the new critters. All right, so let's go over the Poke Shell and its Critter Morph variants. The Poke Shell had one change, and that's going to be the amount consumed per cycle. It used to be at 140 kilograms per cycle, but now it got cut down to 70. A uh, good change, as I would say so myself, as this means that we have to feed them less when tame. Now, the uh, variations of the Poke Shell, let's get into it. The Sandy Shell. This Sandy Shell has a couple of things. It's very powerful as it removes germs from any of the liquids it's submerged in. As long as it's in a germy liquid, it's going to be actively cleaning it as often as it can. Now, it doesn't clean it always. It's only when it's going through the cleaning animation with its hands up like that. If it's submerged in a liquid that's not water, it will still do it as long as it's germy liquids. So it doesn't have to be water specifically. Any liquid with germs in it, the Sandy Shell will purify. Now, the Sandy Shell is going to be unique compared to the other two in that it does not shed its skin. The skin that it has, it's actually going to stay intact and instead what it gives you is meat. When the baby or the adult die, they will actively give you meat instead of a Poke Shell mold. Now, when a baby Sandy Shell evolves to an adult, it will sadly not give you anything as there is no shed skin and it will only give you meat on death. Meaning that the babies actively 
don't really give you anything, which kind of sucks. But in and of itself, the adult or the baby, when they die, they will give you 4,000 kcals of shellfish. Shellfish is going to be used to make cooked seafood, which is basically cooked fish, opened up so that it also accepts shellfish as a alternative to Paku fillets. Now, of course, it consumes the same amount as the Poke Shell, 70 kilograms per cycle, with the additional consumption of slime. Also, a 50% consumed mass turnover, which is the same as the Poke Shell. So, this has an extra option of slime being consumed and converted into sand if you want that as well. The next one is going to be the Oak Shell. The Oak Shell is just going to be just like the po uh, Poke Shell in that it doesn't do anything weird, doesn't give you meat, and it gives you molt. And the only thing different is that it does not give you lime, instead it gives you lumber. The baby, when this sheds its baby skin into an adult, it will give you 50 kilograms. And when the adult dies, it will give you 500 kilograms. Of course, that's going to be lumber, and it's going to need to be crushed at the rock crusher. Same thing as the lime, of course. Outside of that, same diet plan as the sandy shell. However, it only gives you 25% of the consumed mass. Now, that being said, let's start talking about egg spread. This is typically a 97% chance from a poke show to give you a pinch row egg. And then a 2-1 on oak and sani. If you were to submerge the poke shell in either water or ethanol, you could increase the chance of either egg, depending on which liquid you have it submerged in. However, the tiles of the water are going to be volume based. You need minimum. 350 kilograms per tile any less and the shells do not detect the liquid at all meaning that it will increase the pinch row chance so if you have any combination of liquid to do a stacked liquid that does not bypass it as well i tried doing a liquid stack with visco gel on top or ethanol with water on top it didn't do anything for the oak or sandy shell and we just increased the poke shell chance it's a hard volume counter so it checks for a minimum 350 kilograms. Now, of course, these fish don't die when submerged completely. They actually are able to breathe underwater. So you're not too worried about drowning these guys as they are natural swimmers, so to speak. Of course, you could see at the end too as well, you could have all three guarding the same egg and it doesn't matter what egg it is. As long as it's part of the shell family, all three of them are going to guard it. That's going to be it for the Poke Shells. Let's go next critter on the list. All right, so the next critter morph is going to be the Delectable, as you can see right here. The Delectable has spikes around it. If I were to uh, click on this, you could see the spike color around it. These spikes are actually tonic roots, and they're going to be harvestable on a shearing station. If you do shear the tonic roots, you get the tonic roots right here, eight of them, and that's going to be eight kilograms. And you're going to need four kilograms to make the curried beans, which is going to be the new recipe utilizing the tonic root. Now, before we get into the recipe and the changes there, let's talk about the shovels. The shovels have a base 2% rate to give you a delectable chance. This means that this is going to be a problem as a delectable is less efficient compared to a shovel. The major difference is that a delectable only gives you 8,000 kcals and you cannot starvation ranch them like you would a shovel. A shovel, when tamed and starved and brushed, will lay an egg before it dies, while also providing 20,000 kcals of meat. The Delectable actually starts with half the amount of kcals a shovel does, and will not give you an egg before it dies, meaning that it will starve to death with about a 90% reproduction rate. So that means that you are not going to increase the food that way, and that's going to be a way for you to lose calories if you were to ranch shovels. Now, there's also no way to guarantee a 100% chance. We could only increase the delectable chance. So if you accidentally heat up your shovels, they're going to have a bad time. The delectables in and of itself seem to be a balancing of the shovels, as the chance of getting a delectable means that you lose out on calories. However, you do get the tonic roots, and the problem with that is, is that you have to keep feeding them hot regolith or anything that's in this temperature range that's part of their diet. And because of that, they're not going to regrow the tonic root unless you feed them something within that range. That becomes a little bit troublesome. The tonic root in and of itself, as of now, only has one use. And that's at the gas range making curried beans. The curried beans gives you a buff called hot stuff. Plus athleticism, plus strength. But you sneeze. 
This is going to be a weird trade-off as the sneezing animation guarantees you lose a couple seconds each time randomly to sneezing. The sneezing animation, because it takes a few seconds in the game of Oxygen Uncluded, that converts into like 15, 30 minutes. And in a 24 hour time span, that will add up if you keep sneezing randomly. So I'm not really a fan of this in and of itself. And not only that, the tooltip for the tonic root is that it relieves gassiness. I hope we get something to counteract flatulence in the future, but as of right now, we can't do anything about that yet. Now, quick change, the foodstuffs now actually have tooltips telling you how the effects are going to be on the dupes, specifically on the gas range, on food types. If they carry a buff, it will tell you exactly what it does now, and you can mouse over it. So this is a change from the patch and a well welcome change. Great quality of life change for the uh, kitchen. But the delectable in and of itself, I'm not a fan of it. Probably gonna avoid this any way I can. Now for the next set of critters. All right, the next critter type is going to be the Pip and the Pip variant, the Cuddle Pip. This is probably going to be the highlight of the patch as the Cuddle Pip is amazing. <laughs> the Cuddle Pip seemingly seems like just a flat out upgrade compared to the Pip as it does everything a Pip does. However, it has the added bonus of the hugging of the eggs. So let's go over the Pips first. Before we get started, there is a change to the Pip. Now they're also able to eat Thimble Reeds. The Thimble Reeds is going to be how they could actually increase your Cuddle Pip chance. Each time they eat a Thimble Reed, they will only eat 20% of the growth and it's going to increase the egg chance by 2.5%. This is going to round up each time. So that's going to jump from 2 to 5% and then to 7%. So it's going to just go off and on like that. It's going to look like it's an uneven number, but it's 2.5. So you're going to basically want to have your pips grazed on thimble reeds then. Now, that being said, the cuddle pip actually also plant seeds just like a pip does everything that a pip does however they do consume more calories they consume 20 percent more food compared to the pip counterpart as the pip consumes nine percent and twenty percent whereas the cuddle pip consumes eleven percent and twenty five percent as you can see the uh, cuddle pip consumes a little bit more food but that comes as a cost for having them hug the eggs so every so often your cuddle pips have the uh, nurturing ability to hug said egg. This is going to happen once every half cycle, meaning that your cuddle pip will randomly hug an egg and half a cycle later, it will check again to hug another egg. This is only going to happen every half cycle. And what they will do is they will see if they could path to an egg that they could lullaby. This hug slash cuddle that the cuddle pips do will increase the incubation chance by 100%. So a 5% base goes up to 10%, basically doubling it. And this effect actually stacks with a lullaby. If you were to have an incubator right here and your dupes were to lullaby it, they will actually stack the effect. So the 400% from the lullaby stacks with the 100% and it's additive, meaning that it's a 500% bonus to the egg incubation rate. Now you can see right here, randomly, your cuddle pips are going to stand up and look for hugs. When this happens and if a dupe happens to walk by, just like that, they're going to hug the pip. When the pip hugs like that, they're actually going to go on a hugging spree. When they go on a hugging spree, they're basically going to go to any of the eggs and start cuddling them. And they're going to basically do this as much as they can, as often as they can over the course of a cycle. Now, of course, this requires them to be able to path to set egg and not already cuddled already, meaning that if the eggs are already cuddled, you cannot stack the bonus. Now, of course, this also means that if you have a room with all your eggs or all your incubators at, they're going to try to hug all of the incubating eggs. So that's going to be a great strategy for the Cuddle Pips. Not only that, they actually got buffed again. They actually only require four tiles of space. That's kind of crazy because the Pip counterpart requires 12. That means that if I go into F11, we have 25 critters and 100 tiles. Guess what? None of them are cramped, none of them are overcrowded, and that's because this is perfectly 25 critters. 
the eggs do count as well, and then it doesn't matter what type of egg it is. Until the critter hatches, the egg is only going to take as much space as the initial critter in the room. Meaning that you can have any other egg, and then the uh, cuddle pip is going to count each egg as four tiles of space. They will not get overcrowded, and you can pack more into said room. This is great as you don't want them having that overcrowded debuff anyways when you want them in the incubator room. So they're going to be a great addition for that as this will just increase your egg chance. And if you don't want to have incubators, you could just use the cuddle pips. Now, the only thing that's an issue with this is that when they stand up for the hugging animation, it will only last 30 seconds to real time. Meaning that if a duplicate does not happen to walk by in that same time span, they will not trigger the uh, hugging spree with all the hearts and animations so your duplicates will not actually seek out the pips it's literally 100 percent happen chance so if you don't have a lot of dupes being active have a lot of idle dupes you're not going to run by they're not going to get hugged which is sad times right make sure to hug your pips once a day and they are also going to provide the same amount of meat as a normal pip that being said, the hug also provides a minus 5% stress modifier that lasts for half a cycle on the, on the duplicate that happens to hug said cuddle pip. The cuddle pip spree lasts for a cycle and a non-hugged pip will do one hug every half cycle. The hug lasts for around 30 seconds for the animation. They're basically just going to stand up like this randomly. There's nothing that really triggers it that I could tell doesn't matter if there is navigation or if a dupe is nearby, they seem to just stand up randomly. Each time a cuddle pip eats a thimble reed, they're actually only going to increase their egg chance by 1%. It's going to be down from the 2.5 from the regular pip, but otherwise they don't have a way of giving you a pip egg after that. There's no way to increase pip egg chance, however, so be warned. However, that's not a problem because they do everything a pip does and they're just as cute. Now, for the uh, next critter is more so going to be an update and not a new morph. Alright, so the next change is actually a little bit of a bug fix. There used to be a weird bug with the glossy Drekos. I actually was somewhat aware of it, but I did not know entirely how it worked. I just know that I benefited from it. And the change is basically that the glossy Drekos, if you didn't know, used to have a bug where after each time they consume the mule wood, if it of course reaches the threshold, it allows the Dracos to top off their calories to when they were spawned, meaning that they max out. So a starving Draco would be able to eat one meal wood and then last for the entire life cycle as if they were not eating because they would instantly replenish from their base amount that they had at the time to how much they spawned to. So they were basically generating calories magically. Now, this also meant that the tooltip of how much consumed by the Glossy Draco was not correct, as they would consume multiple times per cycle of a fully grown mealwood. However, it was never the case that they actually consumed more than one mealwood per Draco at the ranch. So because of that, there were some changes to this. They fixed the glitch with the Glossy Drecos, and they will now consume as much calories as they should. However, they also dumbed down the amount of calories required to feed a Glossy Dreco, going from a full meal wood per cycle to just one third of a meal wood per cycle. Your Glossy Dreco ranches, depending on how they're designed, may need an overhaul. However, if you do have at least one meal wood per Glossy, you're gonna be fine. Now, for the next set of changes, it's going to be non-critter based. Now, the next thing we're going to be going over is going to be the overjoyed reaction, specifically Yodeler. This guy right here, Steve, is going to be one of the new dupes, and he is Yodeling. Yodeling provides a buff called Serenade on other duplicates. If they've been serenaded, they get a miniature buff of the Yodeling. This is very similar to Sparkle Streaker. However, Yodeling does not affect athleticism. Instead, it affects machinery, construction, and strength at plus 8. The Serenade Minor buff is a plus 5 version of the same three types. And of course, the buff lasts for exactly one cycle. Now, this is going to be depending on when they get serenaded, because the Yodeler is going to Yodel for the entire cycle. If he catches someone at the end of the cycle, that's going to be when the buff starts ticking. Meaning that if he catches someone at the end of the Yodel, he's going to buff someone for a full cycle starting then. 
So not everyone's buff is going to last the same. And of course, the Yodeling seems to be not a 100% application, meaning that although nearby dupes can get serenaded, just being nearby a Yodeler does not guarantee that you're going to be serenaded. As we're going to move Amari, as you can see, he's next to Steve. I do not know what you need to do. It doesn't seem that being nearby is enough. We could walk past him. Nothing's happening. However, he can randomly just pick up the Yodel buff from Steve. Don't know what it is you need to do specifically. Being close enough is not enough. Maybe it's a chance of application. Maybe they need to chat specifically. And there we go, serenaded. Just like that, he has the music note out of his mouth. However, the, the Yodeler is going to be having the golden music notes. That's going to be the overjoyed reaction, and it is not bad. And of course, we have our new duplicate, Steve, Amari. We also have Pei, and we also have Quinn. These new duplicates are going to be the uh, new four duplicates part of the uh, Pretty Pot selection. So of course, check those guys out, and this is the overjoyed yodeling debuff. Now the next one is going to be the Banshee Whale, and just like that, we could see Amari wailing. What happens when he does a uh, whale like that, and he lets out a scream? He consumes a lot more air while whaling. He consumes 7.5 kilograms per cycle. Afterwards, he's guzzling air at a plus 1,000 grams per cycle, so that's on top of how much he's already breathing. And duplicates that have not been disturbed by the whale yet will run away. So he will cause other duplicates to flee from him unless they have already witnessed a whale. If they're already disturbed, they're not going to run a second time. Also, the whale wing is going to be an 8 tile radius. It's going to be similar to a deodorizer and how it works. However, it's going to be from the center. You have 8 tiles in all directions. And then you have the diagonals in between. And everything in this area is going to be affected. However, just like a deodorizer, it is not affected by solid walls, meaning that although you can yell at a solid wall, the sound does not pierce through it. So pneumatic doors, airflow tiles, anything that allows gas through is going to let the whale through as well. However, solids will stop that, meaning that if you have a duplicate whaling on a specific floor, the other floors will not actually run away and flee from the whaling. Also... Also, duplicates affected by the whale have a plus 10% stress per cycle, lasting half a cycle. So it's going to be 8 tile radius from where the duplicate starts, so that's going to be a pretty wide radius. Now, of course, the whaling is going to be a multiple times, and the main feature about this is about the amount of oxygen they consume. As you can see, the gas is running close towards them. You could actually see the animation of the gas pulling towards the duplicate as guzzling air and the whaling debuff is going to be the uh, low oxygen uh, producer for this guy. Deafening Shriek, 7.5 kilograms per second of air consumption. And then afterwards, you have guzzling air. As you could see... There it is, guzzling air, plus a thousand grams per second. So that's going to be the stress reaction banshee. Watch out for that. It doesn't seem to be too devastating. However, if your duplicates are working in the area, having them immediately stop and run away can be pretty bad. And if you guys don't have oxygen included in your colonies, the air consumption can prove to be devastating. And now next, we have a little bit of clothing changes, along with some bug fixes and some other patches as well. Now, the next set of changes has to do with fashion. We have a new building called the Clothing Refashionator, allowing you to turn a snazzy suit and upgrade it to a Primo garb. There is going to be 12 different Primo garb selections for you to choose from. However, they're all just aesthetically pleasing for you to change some of the outfits for your duplicates. Outside of that, there are just going to be an upgraded decor version of the snazzy suit. All of them function the same way. It's just going to change how your duplicates will run around and how they look while they do so. This also is going to be another change applied along with that. Any of the outfits applied to the duplicates are now going to show up on the skill tree screen. This means that if they have a default clothing, it's going to show default. However, if they have some of the cool vest or some of the snazzy suits, it's going to appear on here as well. As well as the other Primo garbs I just mentioned. 
Now, of course, the recipe for all this is always going to be the same. Snazzy plus three reed fiber. So go get all the snazzy suits and make sure your duplicates look nice and fresh. Got to tailor made the clothes, you know. Now, the other change is going to be a jumping animation on the movement. There used to be a bug where if you have a situation like this, where you have a tile open space and you could jump to this tile. And if there was a tile here, you could not jump back down as this tile will block the jumping from the top to lower tile. But now you can actually do that now as they're going to, uh, well, the patch is already live, but the change just makes it so that you could jump back down as, uh, as well. Now the Rover actually had the same bug with this, but it's also fixed as well. So it's a very minor change. If you guys noticed that before where your duplicates will jump up to a ledge, but then it can't jump back down. There's a weird issue with that. This is what that was and it's patched now. There's also a lot of other patches for the bugs into the game. There used to be a weird bug with the Paku. If you have a mixed liquid tank, they would only stay in one liquid. There was also another bug where your flying critters will go into your water, swim, and even though they have a way to fly out, they choose not to do so. And of course, that would mean that the flying critters would drown a lot of the times, and that'd be a bad time for them. Now, of course, they would do it on their own there is nothing we could do about that but that's been fixed as well there are a lot of other issues as well i'm not going to go over each and every single one of the bug fixes sadly but there are a lot of those another notable one is you can no longer mine neutronium as it is auto canceled not only that you can no longer trigger the instant mining with super productive Though there's some big changes that affect some very niche speedruns such as the uh, rocket launch speedrun but uh, I'm not going to get into that. There's also a couple of other minor things like the movement of the gas range tile for some of the outputs of the uh, gas range. If you go into the overlay, the uh, intake tile is changed and moved down. And there is also a couple of animation changes as well as a buff to a arcade cabinet. This arcade cabinet used to be generating 4,000 heat, only providing two morale, and the stress modifier was only 10%. This got jumped up from two to three morale, heat got cut down from 4K to 2K, and the passive modifier goes from 10% minus stress to 15% minus stress. Overall, a buff for the arcade cabinet. So it's kind of nice, making it more appealing. However, the 1,200 watts requirement is still a little bit too much for my liking at least now in the spaced out dlc there is one other change and that's going to be the steam engine the steam engine used to only be able to be built with steel however with the new patch you can now use refined metal as an alternative however this is only in the spaced out dlc not in the vanilla game. There is also a change to the artifact analysis station as well as the botanical analyzer. They required a very specific skill set and were a very specific job type. Now, instead of having a very specific job type, it's going to have multiple job types in order to operate the building. This probably stems from the fact that a lot of people thought that you didn't need a specific skill. So that means if you have a researcher that can't decorate, they could still use the artifact analysis station as before they couldn't. Now, same thing for the botanical analyzer. Now it belongs to both farming and researching. So you can do it with both. And that stems from how the required skill was inside of the farming tab. Although you would use this in the farming tab, the farming skill did not allow you to use the building, which was kind of weird. But this is a quality of life change in and of itself. But with that, guys, that has been the most, if not all of the changes. I did not mention some of the minor changes. Did not go over every bugs that was fixed, every optimization that was added in by Clay. But has been overall a great patch. Reduced lag, new critter morbs, and new suits for the duplicates to run around in. But guys, if you guys have any questions about the Fast Friends patch that just released, leave a comment down below. Hope you guys enjoyed today's video. And of course, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, guys.